sitting in their classes. They were, were quite remarkable. The other thing I'll mention to you is that I received a gift of silence uh, a year and a half or so ago. I functioned very well, but in these kind of buildings, I never know if I'm talking loud enough. So I don't know if I'm talking too loud or if I'm screaming at you. So if I start talking too loud, tell me thumbs down or thumbs up, something like that. And if you have questions, uh, it'll be difficult for me to hear you, but I, I will come to you or you can come to me or something because we need to ask the questions. And that's what this is sort of all about. And uh, some of the things that we're going to, uh, uh, well, I'll find it here. <laughs> some of the things that we'll talk about tonight uh, will segue quite well into what uh, Al Gettix will be here in a couple of days to talk to you about. He's a writer, professor at, uh, at the Cross, actually uh, uh, probably the most knowledgeable man in Wisconsin about mining in Wisconsin, if not in North America and South America. He's an absolute expert on any and all aspects of mining. And I think you would enjoy uh, this presentation uh, very much. The, uh, it'll start running and then we'll be ready to go. I'd like to thank Stevens Point, the students for the Democratic Society, uh, certainly the facility managers here for spending the time they did uh, working on this. And I had the luxury of meeting one of my old students. I was a school teacher up in Fort Wayne, Wisconsin for uh, many years. And uh, every once in a while, I run into some of our pride and joy that are you know, in the colleges and universities, tech schools, and things like that. But I always uh, enjoy that. This is about mining, but it's about water. And I think many of us in northern Wisconsin recognize that this is a resource war, and it's about water. Now, mining is part of that, probably an important part, but this mining is a threat to all of us. It's a threat to the rivers, the groundwater, and certainly to my grandkids, and those grandkids will follow after them as to what we have uh, up in northern Wisconsin. We have a variety of uh, issues facing us with mining. I don't want to uh, uh, ignore them, but certainly anybody that's around frac sand, gold mining, lead mining, zinc mining, more gold mining, silver mining, iron ore mining, gravel pits, uh, we have all kinds of regulations to cover all of these aspects of mining. Taconite mining is, uh, falls within these regulations, and we will constantly hear these discussions about what's taconite. Taconite starts out as a rock like this, and they're very heavy. This rock is maybe 20%. Uh, iron. If I put a magnet on it, on the very top, the magnet would stick. If I put the magnet on the bottom, it won't stick. Seventy percent of this rock, or grandfather, depending on your cultural reference to the grandfathers, is waste rock in terms of taconite. This rock, its grandfather, becomes Pellets. And therein begins the story and the problem of producing these pellets. So when we think about these pellets, when we think about this uh, rock and the iron contact content, it's about 20 to 30 percent. The mine that my grandfathers knew 
that we always hear so much about in the slick advertising were 50, 60 percent iron. They weren't shipped out of Ashland County and Iron County in pellet form. They were shipped out in rock form. Much different process came from underground mining, not open pit mining. Next thing you'll hear a lot about is ferrous mining. Uh, they're all allies. They all everything that's uh, Latin term means there's iron. And we have to say most, but not all ferrous alloys are magnetic because stainless steel isn't magnetic. I don't spend a lot of time talking about ferrous and non-ferrous rock, especially in a university setting, because everyone knows more about it ferrous and non-ferrous minerals and rocks than I do. Non-ferrous is any metal, any metal that does not contain iron. It simply doesn't make any difference if it's ferrous metal or non-ferrous. It doesn't make any difference. The problem comes protecting the water, what happens to the tailings, and what is in the tailings. Now when this project started, public radio, the people that were analyzing the rocks at Northland College, most of the community said, there's no sulfides up there. We're not talking about sulfide mining. <coughs> well, granted, technically we're not talking about sulfide mining, but there's pyrite there. And to get to the rock, they have to go through sulfide material. The question we would like answered is, how much sulfide is there? That's a question that could remain unanswered if AB 426 uh, passes the legislature. The bill passes, we may never get an answer to that question. Why not? We won't have the opportunity to ask the question. There will be no, what we call it, master hearings or contested case hearings in the Senate. Because that's the point, the part of law that gives all of us the opportunity to go and ask questions to mining companies, to their engineers, and they have to answer them under oath. We have to ask the questions in good faith. Now, I present material I need to present it also as factual. Well, as a junior high teacher, now how factual can I come up with information? But at least I can ask the questions and I can submit the questions in writing. And they were given, typically given so many days to answer. And this question is, we know what's going to happen to the tailings. We want to know what is in the tailings. We want to know what's going to be used as explosives. We want to know what chemicals will be used. We want to know gas, oil, how is all of that stuff collected from this heavy machinery. Those are questions that have been unanswered. And we don't think we'll get an answer to them, and hopefully that'll become obvious as we go through this. We'll talk about the geography. We'll talk about the governments. We'll talk about the nations the legislative process and what is at stake. When I'm finished, I hope that we will have addressed most, if not all, of those issues. We haven't been asked the questions and we'll try to answer. The first map isn't real well done, but it is significant that this is all of the uh, mining activity around Lake Superior, largest freshwater body in the state, of, in the world. What we have been asking for for the last 25 years that when you do an EIS, we would like regional environmental impact statements. The way it is now, <coughs> you do an environment, in, environmental impact statement for this project, this project, for every dot. It all ends up in Lake Superior. So we would like to know what's the regional uh, impact of what's going to happen. Uh, to, the, to the water. So I ask that question is important. My senior year in high school, we moved down to Elman, Wisconsin, 1963. I ran around working for Jim Burns and Sons, potato growers, nice people to work for. 
good Irish people that came from the same stock I did. We poured atrazine in the groundwater, and the company said it was perfectly safe to use. We drove trucks to carry the sulfur mixture to kill the potato plants off, poured it in the water, killed off the potato vines so they all died at the same time. The only way we could drive those trucks was with the windshield broken out of the front and out of the back. And if you smoke cigarettes and you wrap them in saran wrap and put them in your pocket, a fresh pack of cigarettes unopened, wrapped it in saran wrap, put them in your pocket, by noon you smoke a cigarette, it tastes like that copper stuff. Perfectly safe. All of those chemicals are banned now, and I think we all know that. The Pinocchi Hills are located right up here. And we'll take a look at uh, some other maps. I kind of apologize for the way it's mouth. This is a uh, uh, fair bit about uh, ceded territory. And the Pinocchi Hills run through ceded territory. And that has some interesting implications. The, uh, Nations on that slide I showed you that we need to be cognizant of. Chibway, Boca, and Island, This is roughly the boundaries of ceded territory. And there are some unique implications of ceded territory in how uh, uh, mining is done. The actual counties of ceded territory covers this, this whole region. All of this is ceded territory. This is the seat of territory in Michigan, Wisconsin, or uh, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin. This is where Ashland County is located. This is where Iron County is located. The uh, uh, areas that are most, uh, that have the heaviest impact of the mine. Iron County basically gets the jobs. Ashland County will too, but all of the waste all the waste water, all the waste product will end up in the Bad River. And this is the Bad River Reservation. And this the Pinocchio goes through. These are other, the other reservations in Cedar Territory, uh, other than the Potawatomi Reservation that are all Cedar <coughs> Nations. Another map, uh, maps don't show up real well. We can't really do much with the lights. But this shows you the areas that have been leased, where there's been boring, where there has been mining, and it surrounds Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. This uh, state of Wisconsin, when they started this mining project, they were asked by a company, Bogeby Taconite, GTAC, we need to change the rules. The laws just aren't going to help us put this mine in. And the state of Wisconsin quickly, under the jobs mantra of saying we want to create employment, started working with the company, unbeknownst to most, if not all, the people that live in northern Wisconsin. What was ignored by the state is that in this whole area of ceded territory, and I don't want to pass myself off as a person that knows anything about ceded territory. Anything I say about ceded territory, I was given permission to talk about from an elder in Bad River by the name of Joe Rose. So I uh, uh, am not just shooting from the lip here. I, I, was instructed by him as to what needs to be presented in his view. <coughs> State of Wisconsin does not have unfettered discretion in the territory. There are usufructory rights. There's a fiduciary responsibility. There are reserved rights that are held by the uh, Ojibwe nations, the Ojibwe governments. There's a treatment of state or possibly treatment of, of nations. There's a public trust doctrine. Water is held in a public trust for all of us. That's been ignored. Uh, the Doyle administration and the Bush administration, uh, George Bush's president, 
said you will negotiate and include Indian nations, Native American nations, in discussions that affect their reserves, their reservations, or their rights. And in this case, there are rights. Yeah. There are others in the audience that can speak to those with much more authority than I can. We have a lot of metallic mineral deposits in northern Wisconsin, this being the largest uh, a 22 mile stretch of uh, the Pinocchi Hills, as we call them, that uh, uh, is where the mine would go in. Roughly covering from Hurley, Wisconsin to uh, west of Mellon, Wisconsin. The first proposal is to put in a four and a half mile long, a mile and a half wide open pit mine. And that would be located, to be a location where it is, right there, roughly uh, 200 plus miles north of Madison. The uh, a proposed mine site, uh, this is the Bad River Indian Reservation, Superior, and there's a proposed mine site. I think you understand that that's well within the confines and the borders of, of ceded territory. In fact, it's maybe two or three miles away the crow flies that mine site from uh, the reservation borders. Another shot of this, Pinocchi Range, Pinocchi Mine, it's an open pit mine, uh, 22 miles long, mile and a half wide, roughly 12 to 1,500 feet deep, and this is the confines of the actual uh, reservation as uh, we know it today. This uh, 12 to 1,500 feet is pretty significant. The hydrology of the area uh, tells us that roughly it takes 50 years for water to flow from the Pinocchis to the Bad River out to Lake Superior. Lake Superior is held at roughly 600 feet plus or minus you know, a few feet by international treaty above sea level. The Pinocchis are anywhere from 12 to uh, 11 to 12, maybe 1,300 feet high at the highest spot. This mine would be below sea level. It would be possibly below lake level. What happens to the water? Where's the water going to, to go? It'll fill into the mine. Now, that can be argued because we can't model that. We can't prove it. But I can certainly give you the documentation from the city of Hurley with all the underground mines, and they had to pump the water all, all the time. In fact, for a while after they quit mining there in the 60s, the, the roads would sink. They literally filled them with water to keep the roads from sinking. So there's, there's a lot of evidence that says this water is very serious. Now, the other thing I'll tell you is no matter when you drive through the Pinocchis, there's always water that comes out of the rock because of the cracks and the fissures and the way the water flows. We know some of that just because we've wandered through that so often. There has never been a real definitive study on how water flows through the Pinocchis. So when we talk a little more about AB 26, it starts to become a little more apparent why there are such stringent timelines put into this uh, project for the state to mandate DNR. You got 100 days to prove this. You got you know, 160 days to prove this. If you don't have it done, the state will automatically give uh, the permit to the mining company. That would be a state permit. Certainly more to it than that. Water on the line. So I think, yeah, do you have any questions about where this is, where it's located? I, I, I think that that's, that's real important that we understand that. Yes? Who currently owns all of my 22 miles? I, I, I'm telling you, I gotta get real close. Uh, <laughs> who owns the land? Well, that's interesting. Who owns the land? For a long time, I thought that the land 
as much of the land in the northern Wisconsin was given back to the counties uh, during the Depression, and the counties took the land back begrudgingly. They didn't really want it. Uh, I, I'm not sure about Ashland and Iron County, but Bayfield County was a full pay county. So if you took the land back, the county then paid the townships the taxes they would have gathered on that land so the townships didn't go broke. That was the assumption I think most of us made was that the land uh, went back to the counties during the Depression. Well, it comes to find out that that may not be true. There were an awful lot of off-reservation allotments given. And Highway 77, well, I don't have it up, I'll show you the next one. Highway 77 runs through there now, but some of that allotted land apparently fell into the, uh, a fellow by the name of, I think his first name was Henry Gilbert, and it's still in the Civil War, was doing a lot of the negotiating, and he ended up with some of that allotted land. And from there, it passed over to an organization in uh, uh, Michigan uh, by the name of La Pointe Mining. And this may have happened anywhere from 1854 to, I don't know, the early 1900s. The reason I say I don't know is that most of those records are gone, if not all. And mm -hmm. uh, before I came down the state, we were at the BIA office trying to find all of the land allotments that would have started in 1854. There are no records of that. They have records of a lot of land after that. So I think your question was, you know, how did the companies come by the land and, and how did that transfer? They've had the land or they've had the mineral rights to the land uh, for practically since early 1900s, if not before. Railroads went through, they were given some rights to the land. The timber companies got some rights to the land. Uh, most of those rights kind of uh, traveled back and forth, but in the end, as we travel or we research the, the deeds, again, so Point Mining has had these mineral rights for quite some time. Now, there's a lot of discussion about that because. There are others who will argue that the boundaries of Bad River were originally the Pinocchies. And I think we have people that are, once again, researching that to, to make some sense out of it. Because when all the treaty negotiation was being done, it certainly wasn't being done on township boundaries because there weren't any townships. So, you know, exactly when we have abstracts of property, Exactly where did that happen? And that information is not really available. You can't find it. So if, if that answers your question, I, I'm happy. <laughs> That's a, I, I didn't hear you very well. <laughs> Other questions? Right here. Right here. Yes. I just wanted to add to something. Right you mentioned a fellow by the name of Henry Gilbert. This guy is part of our history. The U.S. Indian agent that negotiated the 19th century treaties on behalf of the federal government. If it is shown that he gave into ownership of any land in the ceded territory, and especially a lot, that at minimum, is a conflict of interest, and more likely would be uh, some sort of fraud or misconduct on his part. And so that's very interesting. I was not aware of, of that, but I just wanted to uh, uh, share that. Thank you. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Andrew Gokey, Andy, good friend, and a uh, very knowledgeable person. Uh, all of this treaty right, discussion. Uh, Every lady to the north, the shadow of the streams, the rivers. 23 of these are either exceptional waters or outstanding waters. One of the only places, probably in North America, we're told now, but certainly on Lake Superior, it's the only place that has 
this number of outstanding, pristine waters. There are no other places. And that comes from the Corps of Engineers. This is another shot of the Bad River watershed. And I think what's real significant here is that when the first proposal was made, and we'll talk about that, and there's the 22 mile mine site. This is the spot of the uh, actual uh, mine where it would go in, the first, uh, the, the first phase of the mine. This is the area where the waste would go, 815 uh, acres, was signed over by uh, uh, lease from Iron County to Gogebe Taconite. Now, the reason Gogebe Taconite was uh, interested in this land was that they could throw the waste on the other side of the Pinocchies. There are many of us that don't think that Gogebe Taconite was aware of the fact that the Pinocchi Hills go through the Bad River watershed. All of the water from this area, now if you're familiar with the area, I was raised right out in here, on Highway 13, tail end of the watershed, about seven, eight miles north of Glidden, where the Great Divide goes through. All of that water flows to the north, goes up through the Bad River, flows through Mellon, through the Mellon Gap, on down to Lake Superior. So it makes no difference which side of the Pinocchies you are on. The Pinocchi Hills go right through the Bad River watershed. The uh, uh, first stage, 4.5 miles, mile and a half wide, and this shows you the area of the, uh, uh, where the waste would go. The contract's on a web page. By the way, everything I'm telling you is on a web page called SaveTheWatersEdge.com. It's a web page that my son and myself and a couple of others maintain. It was put together to prepare for a contested case hearing. And since we don't think we may have contested case hearings, it quickly became a web page. It's a repository of all kinds of information that has come from geologists and people you know, all over Wisconsin. And it's, it's a cumbersome page, but it, it's all there. Yes? Do you want to get questions for him? Um, geographically, where's the National Forest? Okay, where is the National Forest? Are you familiar with Copper Falls? Okay. Copper Falls is not necessarily a national forest, but it's, uh, what, two miles away, a mile and a half away, about the way the crow flies. The uh, gentleman who was the curator, the head ranger at Copper Falls for 34 years, testified in Madison in front of the finance committee and said if this mine goes in, Copper Falls is gone. It'll be destroyed. The National Forest, uh, most of the National Forest, let me have time to think this through a bit, but I, I, most of the National Forest would be, Schwabigan Forest would be over in, uh, more so in Bayfield County. There's some Schwabigan Forest down here in Ashland County. I'm not sure about Iron County but there are, I don't think there is any national forest property that goes right through the, the Pinocchies. There is county land and state land, but I, I, it's a good question, but I don't think there's any national forest land here. Now, there could be, but I don't think so. If there is, there are no national forest campgrounds and, and things like that in the area. Most of those are to the, further to the west. Now, if you were asking about Ashland County or uh, Bayfield County, that Pinocchio's probably do go into the National Forest on the other side. And that's uh, the, the two ends of the Pinocchio's are, there's interesting things going on there in terms of uh, gold uh, mining right now, uh, at least ex uh, well, it's the exploration of nothing else. The uh, watershed, and I point this out to you because you have the White River watershed, the Moringo River watershed, Potter Forks, and so on and so forth, and the Upper Bad River watershed, and the Lower Bad River watershed. For people that look at the maps on the DNR sites, this can be kind of 
this could be confusing. So for us, this whole thing is considered to be the Bad River watershed. All of this water eventually finds its way into the Bad River and uh, uh, flows down into the Chicago Slopes. This gives you a sense of where the reservation is, again, where the map is. And this is a picture of that exploded area. But we'll take that area and put it up. This is the 815 acres of critical habitats that's destroyed. Now, under the current law, the way it's written, I'm quite sure that if you lived in Whitefish Bay or Cudahy or Milwaukee, Milwaukee County, you would love to get 815 acres of mitigated <coughs> wetlands. That's the way the law is written. That 815 acres doesn't have to be replaced in Iron County or Ashland County, Northern Wisconsin, and Ceded Territory. It can go anywhere. And the experts on, uh, on uh, wetland mitigation are probably in Wisconsin's D&R. We'll tell you, common sense will tell you, you can't take 1,800 or 815 acres from northern Wisconsin and move it to the south and not leave a mess. Now, every one of these spots, this is the Potter Forks River. The question was posed to Bill Williams. Bill, are you going to dam the Potter Forks River? No, we're not going to dam the Potter Forks River. The answer. Bill, are you going to change the course of the Tyler Forks River? No, we're not going to change the course of the Tyler Forks River. This is Bull Gus. Same question was put. Are you going to change or dam Bull Gus Creek? Answer, we're not going to touch the Tyler Forks River. Four times the question was asked, four times the same answer. They're not going to touch Bull Gus Creek. So either Bull Gus Creek will be dammed, or they will have to dig a new uh, creek bed. So why would they dam those us creek? They need water. They need 1,700 gallons of water for every ton of taconite that's produced. There's not enough water. There's not enough water up there by anyone's estimation that will pro provide for the facility that's being planned. So right now, uh, considering uh, pumping in water from Ironwood, Michigan, at about a million gallons a day, a uh, million point four gallons a day, anyone that's familiar with how municipal water systems work, they all do kind of a CMR, a compliance maintenance report, spikes. You know, I think we all realize that every once in a while you got to put more chlorine in the water because it, it spikes the, and you can't drink city water for two or three days. We requested, we're requesting those records to go and look at it. And then we want to have someone analyze what the parts per million of that chlorine is, what would the effect of putting chlorinated water into the Bad River watershed. Might that affect fish eggs? Might it affect the plant beans? Who knows what it's going to affect? But we want to know before this project starts. If it affects nothing, so the study is a waste of time. But it's a pretty valid question. We posed the same question to the city of Mellon. I went to Mellon and said, I'd like to see your CMAR, re CMAR reports. When I was town chairman in a small township, you were also president of the sanitary district. And that's how I became very familiar with all of these kinds of reporting systems. And they said, well, we're not sure if you can see it. And we went through that discussion, and we could see them. Two weeks later, they decided not to use the melon water because there wasn't enough water in melon. And at that time, they were looking at using a 4,000-gallon uh, truck to transfer water. Many volunteer firemen in here, uh, milk truck drivers that know anything about 4,000 gallons of water on back roads in northern Wisconsin, you need to drive down the middle of the road because you get over where it's soft, you roll those things over. 
and, and that's what often happens to milk trucks. <laughs> the other issue that came up was, we said, and this map, by the way, was done by a young man, Carl Sack, who is a cartographer. Uh, he got us down at the University of Wisconsin, <coughs> made the map. I'll tell you, that map's accurate. If there's nothing else in this world about this uh, mine that may be uh, conjecture or up for grabs, this map isn't. At initial blush, uh, the company said, well, uh, we're not sure the map is accurate. We had another map. You can't find a place on either side of the penalties. It doesn't look like this. At the last public hearing in Mellon, Wisconsin, uh, I don't know if I have a, I do. The, uh, one of the representatives wanted to know about the waste. Uh, they made the decision to go ahead with them. So we walked up and gave them this map. They had never seen it. They had never looked at the map. And we had repeatedly sent emails, sent copies of this map over the electronic, through the electronic world to say, look at this map and justify putting these tailings here. Well, the answer to putting tailings in this wet area is that we have the technology to deal with it. We'll take care of that. And I'm back to making those little pellets out of the grandfathers. I make those pellets creates a lot of dust. The answer was, we will dry pack that stuff. When we dry pack it, uh, if it gets real windy, we spray it with water. And that keeps the dust down. Well, it's already in a wetland. I also need to tell you that this area, at the elevation it is, and if you follow the weather patterns, as the warm air comes across the lake or the moist air hits the cold air coming up from the south, that's the snow belt. Bad river floods every year. Some years it floods a lot, some years it floods a little bit. And when I say floods a lot, highways are flooded, roads are flooded, and the community can be stranded. If it floods a little bit, you know, the back roads, the swamps are flooded, and it's, it's pretty hard to get through the area. With that amount of water, the snowfall, the rains that they get, how are we going to protect those tailing piles? And they want to fill in this 815 acres. And that's become another sticky wicket in this, this whole process. Now, there are very few mining experts. And if there are any in the audience, I certainly would give them equal opportunity. But we have found very few mining experts that are willing to say there are no sulfides in the Pinocchios. And it can be mined uh, responsibly. The definition of responsible mining is pretty scary. It includes things like common good, or I'll show you a sentence in a couple of minutes. That's in there. The, uh, company that's looking at putting this in as a coal mining company. This is what they're used to doing, and this was, I don't know, Kentucky, West Virginia. They cut off the top of the mountain, and they fill in the ravines. That's how they deal with waste. That's how uh, coal industry is operated. This is even a little better picture of that. Each one of these were mountains. They cut off a section, throw the, the waste in the, in the, in the valleys, take the coal out, and these are the roads that go up around. And this was all a valley that looked like this. And that's all filled in with uh, uh, the mountaintop removal mining. I think you're going to have a, a couple people come up to Stevens Point from that area that are going to talk about mountaintop removal mining. And then they're going to come up to northern Wisconsin and spend a couple days with us. What I understand is, and we were all under the impression, I certainly was, that you no longer could remove the top of mountains. I guess that's not accurate. I guess what's accurate is you can remove the tops of the mountains. You can't throw them in the ravines. And there are really powerful stories 
that come out of how, not out of this particular place, but how the people who lived there were treated with those, with those valley fills. On the one hand, now it's come to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. We have never seen in the state of Wisconsin a project of this magnitude. If any of you are familiar with the Iron Range, that's what we'll have. There'll be a complete facility to put in to produce pellets. There'll be a complete facility to put in to do the mining. <coughs> uh, speculation is there'll be seven or 800 jobs. People in around the world tell us might be 60. It'll be a very good, efficient, clean mine to be highly mechanized. We don't know at all. We just don't know those things. Uh, another picture of the streams. These are all waterfalls, by the way. And some of these waterfalls are, are they're all beautiful. And some are really significant waterfalls. And you got to take a hike to go see them. And people that have come up have gone through the uh, gone through the Pinocchies and have actually seen these these, these waterfalls. And <laughs> absolutely incredible. Just incredible. Um, it, it, it isn't an area that's been closed to the public. It's just that the public likes to go to Copper Falls because it's a little easier to get there. If you've been to Copper Falls, that's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, other pictures of the falls, the valleys, it's all there. Uh, so what happens to our EIS project process? In the state, we're not sure. Just to go through this, we could always look at a cost analysis, we could expect a financial plan, an environmental mitigation plan, and any additional documentation that we thought was important. This has been translated uh, to, I guess I could put it this way, if you all live in the same area and I come in and I'm going to start a mine and we have a meeting and you, I tell you I'm going to mine copper. Well, you can ask me all the questions you want about sulfides, you can ask me all the questions I want about copper, about water quality, everything else. Answer the questions, everybody's happy, we all go home. I drill a mine and I find uranium. I can mine that uranium. You can't ask me any questions about it, and I can dump the waste on your property. You had the opportunity to ask questions. That window is closed. That's how this law will work. Now, if any of you live near a factory farm, and there's water, a stream going by that factory farm. Give that boss some serious thought. Because if they can rewrite the rods and stomp all over us, those factory farms will be doing the same thing. The, uh, why am I here? What, what brings us out here? What drags Mike Wiggins away from his job as tribal chairman or Mick Isham away from his job as Lifwick chairman or Frank Kane away from Herbster, the back woods where I live. What brings us down here? January 2011, we had a meeting. Matt Fifield said, question was posed. Will you put a mine in under Wisconsin's strict mining regulations? Answer. The question is to influence them to pass legislation that's going to weaken environmental laws, it's going to weaken federal and state air and water quality. The answer is no. You get an answer like that, you pretty much leave the meeting saying, well, I guess we really need to see this plan to see how they're going to do this. Next question was, same meeting. He said the responsibility is we must demonstrate that we'll be able to comply with these very strict standards or we will not receive our permits and there will be no project. Managing Director of Gogeek uh, Techno. Yes? What is Taconite? What is Taconite? Oh, what is Taconite? Oh, good, all right. good question. I'm sorry. This is taconite, these little pellets. That's the ore that comes from grinding up piles and piles of rocks. That's the ore that comes from grinding up these guys. And 
That's the taconite. Considered to be a low grade ore because it takes, you know, 70, 80 pounds of this to make 20 pounds of this, of those pellets. And that waste rock is what's really significant because it's ground so fine, the waste, and the, any chemicals and elements that are in there will be quickly dispersed. And part of the problem is there's so much sulfide in the pyrite. And that sulfide is directly linked to the destruction of wild rice beds and the destruction of fisheries. So that, that the taconite is actually the ore that's ground up and produced in those little pellets. Does that answer your question? Great, yes? What is taconite used for? Who buys it? Well, uh, uh, iron, makes iron. They melt it down and make iron. And I, you know, I, maybe somebody here can tell you more about that, but we're told it pretty much is, uh, as it comes out with the impurities that are still in it, it's probably pig iron, probably rebar, quality iron, things like that, but it does become iron. Most of the taconite that's mined now goes to India or China, and uh, it, it doesn't stay here. We, we don't really have commercial markets for it as we used to. Yes? I heard in the hearing that a lot of this becomes our cars, so would that be a typical use? A lot of them are what? A lot of the uh, material they would mine would be in our cars, just the body of a car? I, that may be. I, I don't know. I, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, you know, and you're in a situation, it's kind of like the old saying of, well, if you're so in favor of clean water, how'd you get here? Did you levitate or drive? I drove. <laughs> I mean, whatever seems to work is what, what comes out in the hearing. Uh, this kind of stuff was taken by the current administration and our legislature be absolute fact that they could put this mine in, they being Rogivi Taconite, which is a coal company pretty much run by Chris Klein out of Florida, West Virginia, I'm not sure where he lives. He lives somewhere though. And there's a running debate whether that's even an American company or not. And they say it's an American company and the stockbrokers say it isn't because it's listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange. I, to me, that's just chatter, because we really need to focus on, on the water issues. Probably uh, the Green Bay Press Gazette did a, a series of articles in uh, January, <laughs> mid-January sometime, and they kind of paired us up with uh, uh, different legislators or whatever and had us <coughs> write a piece, and they wrote a piece, and they ran it. And, I guess it was all right, depending on if you liked the mine, you loved what Representative Souter had to say. You hated the mine, you loved what I had to say. Uh, it's just the way it is. It, it's like. But this <coughs> article, this comment, is this the only beautiful area up here? I hope not. If this is the only pristine area, then there are issues that the state has that go beyond mining. There are hundreds of areas like this up here, and there still would be. That's absolute, pure, unadulterated nonsense. The federal government, the Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Land Management have issued statements about how pristine and how unique the Bad River watershed and the Chicago Sloughs are. And for this to become accepted as common knowledge, and when it's in the paper and this is all people see, they believe it. There are not hundreds of areas like this up here. There are hundreds of areas like this in the northern United States. There are not hundreds of areas that border Lake Superior with the largest wild rice beds in North America. There are not hundreds of areas where the Lake Superior uh, sturgeon still come and spawn. There are not hundreds of areas where people live and use fish as sustenance. There's a big difference 
between me going out there with my uh, spinning rod, catching a couple walleyes in the summer and saying, no, that's enough. That's, you know, I don't need to catch anymore. Or the catch and release crew. Nothing wrong with that. But when you depend on these fish for sustenance, and they're a major source of food in the food supply, that's significantly different. Significant, significantly different in the health. And what's in those fish is extremely important. Sports fishermen can go fish and catch a few fish, take them home and eat them, feed them to their, their, their girls. Feed them to anybody that's of childbearing age in a family. It's not a big deal. They have one or two meals. You can't eat more than one meal a week. And that goes for men and women. You can't eat the big ones. You probably shouldn't eat the small ones. They're toxic. A few years ago, there was a controversy in the North Woods with uh, spearfishing. And a old buddy of mine, an old chum of mine, Walt Rosette and I were over in uh, near Siren, Wisconsin. And a bunch of fish got speared. We had fish advisors we were handing out that the state put out. We got 5,000 of them from DNR. We handed them to some of the wardens who had never read them. We went down along the shoreline and we called the spearers, you better give us the fish because you can't take them home to eat them. They're poisoned. In that lake, they were poisoned fish. So we put the fish in a toxic waste bag, thinking, you know, this is kind of a nice statement. We'll just carry a, toxic, a bag of toxic fish out in a toxic waste bag that there was an EMT, so we grabbed one from the ambulance hall, took it over. Ah, that's cool. We took the fish, we put them in the toxic waste bag, and we started up the hill with them. A warden came up and arrested us. He just read the fish advisory. He said, you guys are carrying toxic waste. That's illegal. And we said, cuff us, man. Take us in. I mean, this would have been just a hope. Yeah. Well, the secretary, the head uh, uh, warden at the time, I think it was George Meyer, came down and said, no. These are the last two guys who want to put cuffs on and take in in Bayfield County right. with the bag of toxic fish. Mm -hmm. that was well, they had quite the discussion what to do with them. And finally, the head warden said, I'll take them with me. And he left with them. And we were chasing him down the road saying, arrest him. No, he's got the toxic fish. <laughs> you know, you've got to have a little fun with this stuff sometimes. But those fish are that toxic. And some of those fish are so toxic that they no longer clean fish on the boats and throw the guts overboard because in the organs is where a lot of that toxicity lives. So they take the fish guts in and I don't know what they do with them, put them in a landfill or something. Uh, but this kind of information to be put out by a company and we, we've kind of told the company, the legislator, that actually as far as I am concerned, there is no credibility left all in this process. It's all about going out of the water. We've had assembly committee hearings. We, we've had assembly committee hearings. We may have had Senate hearings. Now uh, Bob Jelk, a uh, uh, representative, senator from up in our area, Dale Schultz, a senator from down around Richmond Center, where there's also an iron ore deposit, have kind of put together what they're calling the Wisconsin Way. And, uh, it's uh, added more intrigue to the to the whole uh, project. But we I keep telling them, and I, I like, kind of like that map with the explosion on there because that blowing up part of Wisconsin pretty much mirrors ceded territory. What we're telling them is this is about the water. It's not about common good. This is about the water. It's not about jobs. This is about the water. It's not about a healthy, sustainable economy. And if we want to talk sustainable economy, people can come back from north, the North Country and talk to you about sustainable economy. No one's been concerned about the economy where I live for the last 50 years. Now they're concerned about the economy because it's going to produce a few jobs down in uh, Milwaukee for Basiris area and Caterpillar. 
It's a 183 page document, AD 426. The highlights are it eliminates accountability of the public, no public hearing. DNR will not be allowed to monitor the waste site of the facility. The mining waste will be allowed in wetlands and waterways. Uh, it removes contested case areas. There only has to be one public hearing. Currently, they are free. The public hearings that we had now, one of them was at 12.01 after midnight. And fortunately, people in Milwaukee showed up with in pajamas and slippers and got to the hearing. But they are very reckless with these hearings. And by the way, there's never been a hearing in Bad River. There's never been a hearing in Odana, Wisconsin, where all of this stuff floods, flows. Now, if you do nothing else tonight, this probably should be in every fourth grade classroom in Wisconsin. It was at one time. It's a topographical map of Wisconsin. It doesn't take you more than 10 seconds. Here's the Pinocchio Hills. Here's the Bad River watershed. To look at the elevation change. That's where it all goes. That's the way the land is. The glaciers made some beautiful areas up there, and they created a little mischief. And right now, this is the mischief that we're 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 facing. Is this this whole area that is at risk? The uh, bill. I go on now. It's on the web page. I, I, I really don't want to read the whole bill for you. These are the highlights of it. By the way, uh, allowing mining companies to draw down water levels from lakes uh, and streams in the groundwater. That has ignited much of uh, Iron County. That's why you now hear people say, we're in favor of the mine, but you've got to take care of the water. That's why. They can draw down the water from any lake within six miles of the mine site. And it will happen. We've had numerous geologists, fairly well-known people, who have, unbeknownst to almost everybody, from the University of Michigan, from Western universities that have actually done their dissertations, their thesis on the Pinocchis. They've brought students up to the Pinocchis and they would come around and they'd send you stuff in the mail, and they'd send you, you know, you'd get the emails and stuff and we'd say, who the hell are these people? Never heard of them. You know, they're either absolutely right or the biggest flight you ever heard from. And all of a sudden they came up here and started testifying and telling Wisconsin who they were. These people are experts. They know more about the Pinocchios than anyone does, at least from a ge geological reference. And it's powerful testimony. And they provided great insight to water levels. And uh, uh, the bottom one you can't see very well. If you go to court and we have any environmental laws, any water protection laws, any right-of-way laws that conflict with what the mining company wants to do, the bill says it allows mining law to supersede all other environmental regulations. This law says the mining company is strong. Yeah. Uh, it can reroute trout streams, it can dam waterways, it can draw down lakes. The mitigation projects are not limited to the Bad River watershed. Under an EIS, we talk about transportation, communication, housing, schools, payments to local communities, employment projections. The payments to local communities, they, they, they like to give a net proceeds tax. There hasn't been a mine in the United States for the first four years that has ever produce a profit. It doesn't happen. Because those are the years they spend all their money on equipment. I can tell you as a town chairman, 
Those are the years that I need money, or I would have needed money, in my township to repair the roads, repair the bridges, to figure out where we're going to put housing, to figure out how we're going to handle school bus routes, how we're going to put electricity through. You need the money up front. Now, in all fairness, the, the Wisconsin Way Bill talks about $5 million payments and things like that, but that's, that's conversation for right now. Uh, what's at risk? The Bad River Watershed, the Chicago Sloughs, wild rice beds, certainly the homeland of the Bad River Ojibwe, the drinking water, the wells, the wildlife, plant spirits, plant beans, stuff that we have no idea that's out there, that probably medicines that we're not aware of be gone forever. And why they're gone forever? Well, Mike Wiggins, uh, chairman of the Bad River Ojibwe, Joe Rose, elder, there's the site of the first, uh, uh, the first mine site, the first 4.5 miles. Uh, aerial view of it. The uh, problem comes in, and I'm going to skip through these first two slides. This is the problem. This is the sticky wick. The actual mineral, the actual rock, is in at an angle. 52 degree slope or 70 degree slope or wherever they happen to be. So what they have to do is take off all of this overburden on both sides. That's the mile and a half wide. And go down 12 to 1500 feet to get this rock out. And when this comes out, even this is not all iron. <coughs> It needs to be pulverized and ground up. It's maybe 30% iron. So there's the problem with all of the waste. And what do we do with it? It certainly isn't go to Milwaukee to put in Basiris back in Basiris Erie's backyard. So where are you going to put it? We repeatedly ask that question. You can't throw it in 815 acres of wetland because even the most proactive people who want to see a mine will say, no. That area is well known to people in northern Wisconsin. It's been logged. There have been railroads through there. There have been prospectors in there. There have been small little communities in that area. There are places out there where you can park a car and a steady stream of people come and get the water that comes out of the old artesian wells that flow through there. And once the initial shock wore off of all of this legislation that we went through, this AB 426, in those days it was LRB 320 or something, but it's all AB 426 now. That legislation was being written at the exact time we were told in January that there'd be a no attempt to change the laws in the state of Wisconsin. When that bill passed, you get on the web page, you got all kinds of YouTube clips. We don't even, they won't even tell us who wrote the bill. <laughs> so I'll tell you who wrote the bill. It's the bankers, it's the corporations, it was Gogebe Taconite, it was the lobbyists. With a few legislators sitting around, uh, probably Stone, Zipper, and uh, you know, a couple other suspects from down there, and our governor was probably at the table, and so were the Fitzgerald brothers. You now, betcha. I'm hoping one of you is here to stand up and say, no, we didn't do it, these guys did. We don't even know who wrote this thing. Yet it's gone through our legislature. That's not government at all. Back to what Woodbeth taught us. Many experts got on top. We got too caught up with this idea that in our society, we've got the technology to do anything we want. <coughs> we've got the knowledge to figure out how we can do it. And we have no wisdom left to say no. Absolutely no. That water, that rock will be there 100 years from now. I would prefer to let my grandkids figure out how to deal with it and maybe there'll be a safer way to do it. But we don't have it now, and this is the rock. 
it comes out, and these little thin streams are are the the actual stuff that becomes taconite. And of course, the red taconite is the good stuff. That's the stuff that uh, really produces the best taconite, high quality, and this is the kind of tinsy stuff that we have in the uh, canopies. What happens? 20 feet, some places it's five inches, some places it's 20 feet of overburden needs to go. And I'll tell you, when that heavy equipment <coughs> is in, the little people the, that live in that area will stand there with tears in their eyes and say, well, why the hell didn't somebody tell us this was gonna happen? Uh, first explosion that goes off, it rates anywhere from a 1.8 to a 3.2 on a Richter scale. You can only imagine how those little farm animals are going to react to that explosion. We ask, how many of those will there be a day? That's proprietary. Well, will there be more than one a week? That's proprietary. What are you going to use for explosion? That's proprietary. Everything's proprietary. Now, the company will tell you, and this is blasted all over the papers, they're saying, we're not doing any drilling. We're not doing any water testing. We're not doing anything out there because the state of Wisconsin won't guarantee us that when we're finished with this, we can't go ahead. So they do nothing. That's a bunch of crap. The only reason they're not doing anything is they they do it now. It falls under our laws now, which means I can get access to that information because they have water sampling, they have rock sampling, to a we can get that information because they have to submit it to get a permit. So they're just not doing it because they want me and you to know as little as you possibly can about what's going on. These are the kind of neighbors we want. Uh, you know, it's kind of the equipment. Uh, is this an overstatement of what it's gonna look like? I don't know. But I'm sticking with this till they tell me what it's going to look like. And we've asked them to give us pictures, show us where they're going to be. And a modern technique facility is, that's kind of hard to see in this, but you get the general idea of the pictures. Had somebody up in Bayfield, Wisconsin, if you're familiar with uh, Bayfield, Wisconsin, or I'll took pictures with his camera just yesterday, he emailed them to me, of the Pinocchi Hills. And he's trying to superpose on those pictures what those hills will look like from Bayfield. And uh, people are just amazed that they'll see those smokestacks and, and things like that. Um, we hear a lot about taconite from the past, and you know, Wisconsin has got to hear all this stuff about, uh, we got the, the badger, we're the badger state. We've got the miner on our, on our, on our, on our flag, and we're the badger state. Uh, we have a pediatrician in northern Wisconsin that wants to change a Wisconsin flag. She wants the badger gone, and she wants the miner off the flag. She tells us that those miners started mining the lead miners when they were 12 years old. By the time they were 26, most of them were incapacitated or dead. So that's not the legacy I want on my flag. We told her right now she's on her own. <laughs> this will work on a new flag design. <laughs> so people have been sending her flag designs. Uh, interesting. Uh, they range anywhere from dream catchers to uh, uh, red and white Holstein cows. It's, it's really fascinating. But I think that when we talk about those, it, it's an example of the excesses of the, of the past. You know, we could put atrazine in the soil. There was nothing to stop us, so we did. Now you live with it. You know, we could have prevented PCBs, but we were convinced that it would solve all of our problems. And for any of you that are, you know, across that 65 age, you certainly remember the uh, commercials, Ready Kilowatt. Nuclear power will be so cheap that it won't even pay to meter it. Well, we've learned differently. Uh, coal tar sites, all these excesses of the past that we're cleaning up. 
Those days we didn't have the knowledge, now we do. Uh, the history started there in the 1800s, basically ended in 1965, and yeah, some of this is, I think, fairly accurate. Um, uh, it, it certainly was, uh, uh, the important part of this is there was no on-site crushing. The crushing was all sent off to be done in someone else's backyard. And uh, of course, this is kind of out of out of date now. One of the high school students, I do a little substance teaching now and then, just as a mental exercise, and remind myself why I'm retired. <laughs> took a dollar bill and measured it up, and they sat in the back, and they came up with a projection that it would be uh, if you stacked up one billion dollars, it'd be 63 miles high, because we'd said that there's billions and billions of dollars there. To make. That was their input, and that's what it's all about. It's about wild rice. It's about a way of life. It's about the water. It's about where people live. And uh, it is just that simple. Exchanging this for gold doesn't make any sense. And for the students of history, I see no difference between this and the 7th Cavalry going into the Black Hills to get the gold. Don't care about the laws, don't care about everything. We want the gold. Here it's the water. And I've said that repeatedly now. It's about water. And, uh, and I'm going to wear it. Who's buying all the ore and goes in China? I, I don't know. Wherever it goes, I'd like it left there. But I have re said repeatedly that this is about the water. And I think it is. When we look at all those maps we looked at in the beginning, I think we need to keep in mind there are 60 Ojibwe villages that surround Gitchigumi, that surround Lake Superior. On the northern side, it's Ontario, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. All of those <coughs> villages a part of nations that my ancestors made agreements with. It was that escaped Ireland to come over here and uh, become Irish Americans and live here. We made agreements. And I think it's time we honor those, not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, and recognize that it's the water we need. We can't eat gold. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer questions. Uh, got the hard questions. These, I don't know. I taught junior high for many years. I have no feelings left. So. <laughs> Take your best shot. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What can we do? I mean, you're telling us that entire ways of living, species, etc., are going to be destroyed uh, because of the search for profit. I can't feel, I can't help but feel not only a little bit helpless, but also that maybe just calling my legislator is not enough. The legislators down in Madison, in the governor's office, tell us that every time this bill goes around, the company tells us every time. Anybody from Northern Wisconsin goes and makes a presentation. The phone calls are spiked down there. Call them often, call them up, and tell them, no mind. And you got a young man who is uh, in the assembly from uh, Stevens Point. Um, what is his name? Make him governor. I'm telling you. <laughs> This young man actually read the laws and thought about it and asked some very, very meaningful questions. And I'm really not very generous to any of those guys. But he was great. Call them. It's, we have no idea who calls and who emails these legislators. None whatsoever. They think there are 10,000 people that are in all of these groups. But it's those phone calls, and that's uh, 
<coughs> it's all that can be done. And if they, if you get a chance to talk to them, ask them. Ask them, how many jobs are going to come out of this? What's the point of this? If anybody lives down near Horicon Marsh, around Horicon, <coughs> down that area, run into any hey, of the Fitzgeralds, suggest to them that we drain Horicon Marsh, turn it back into a muck farm, which is what it was, and raise great carrots, great jobs. They won't do that to the Horicon Marsh, but they have no qualms about destroying where I live. So I'm asking the people in Horicon to step up to the plate and they'll help us out. And we'll be down there tomorrow someplace in that general area, so we'll see how it goes. Yes? Has an environmental impact statement been done? And if it is, does that, that supersede state law? There hasn't been an environmental impact statement done because there's been no permit issued. Oh, that's this not done until the permit is This whole discussion is over nothing. <laughs> you know, there's no bill, there's no permit, there's no project, there's no nothing. But if the bill passes, whatever happens, that will be how they operate for the next 100 years. And so the thing with the bill is the difference between what's currently in law and what people are trying to push through is that if there's a permit issued, it, there's a difference between how many, um, well, I don't remember what they're called, different um, points at which the, the, the process can stop? Uh, the difference is you can't build a sauna along a trout stream in northern Wisconsin, <laughs> but you'll be able to put mine waste in the trout stream, if not right up to it. I mean, those are the differences. Mm -hmm. You can't dam up trout streams. Sure, you can reroute a trout stream under some conditions, but not to put a mine in. It's at one of the comp, one of the terms in there is that if there's environmental damage, that's expected. There'll be environmental damage. Well, that's not in the new law. The mitigation rules are significantly different. Mm -hmm. The permitting process at DNR can take as much time as they, as they actually need. Now you have to understand the Department of Natural Resources has been pretty much gutted about the law. On the web page, there's a piece written by uh, Dwayne Lottie, who was the water, wetland specialist in northern Wisconsin for 30-some years. Uh, I was chief negotiator. He was president of the school board, and uh, we fought tooth and nail for 15 years back and forth. When this bill passed, he called me up and he said, have you read this? I said, yeah. He wrote testimony and he wrote the letter that he said, go ahead, we put it on the zine section that cites every statute that's now in the law that's being changed or will be violated mm -hmm. under the, the present law. George Meyer, who used to be secretary of the DNR, is now president of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. I listened to him speak the other night. That man has got religion. I mean, he has gone off the deep end compared to what he would have said as the DNR secretary. He really understands the implications of this law and what's going to happen. And he is doing a marvelous job. You get a chance to listen to him, it's worth the time. Or call him up. It's just been tremendous as to what he's been doing. There are hundreds of other people in Wisconsin that are, are doing the same thing. They're just all over the place. Jim Meeker is leaving the Northwoods to come down here and talk about wild rice. Why? I couldn't believe it. You know, that's awesome that he feels so strongly about that. Al Gettix, uh, he'll go anywhere. And he just constantly is out there. It's just a raft of people doing it. Nancy Langstrom from the uh, uh, environment, uh, the Theodore Nelson Environmental Institute, UW, uh, U University of Wisconsin. Incredible. <coughs> Absolutely incredible, the stuff she has on her webpage. Uh, it, it, it's, it's marvelous, the information that's out there, which is amazing this bill can travel through. Yes? Do you see projections on how much will affect the... Uh, what, what was the question? 
Um, do you know how this will affect the tourism economy? Is that oh, I don't know. You know, the company says, uh, and they hired North Star, uh, uh, public, uh, some North Star advertising company, and Wisconsin manufacturers to comments are good buddies in Madison. <laughs> have said it'll increase tourism because people will drive up to see the mine. Oh, right. <laughs> they won't come up the fish, so they want to come up to see the mine. I have no idea. Tour at five dollars a gallon, I think we won't have to worry about tourists at all. It's like sixth grader says, hey Mr. Well, I was calling by the first name. Hey Frank, we got uh, tourist seasons. Does that mean we can hunt them? You know, I don't know. <laughs> That's hard to say. It's hard wow. to say. Yes. Before people leave, we just notice people seem like really antsy to go right now. Thank you for coming. Um, there's obviously a lot of different ways to be involved, and it's so awesome that you're here and all these other people are coming. But then Frank is also going to be coming to, there's an organizing camping retreat. There's two of them. Uh, one is put on by people living in the Bat River area, and that is April 6th and 7th. So different ways to connect with people, to know what's going on, and to organize when the legislature potentially fails us. And also March 17th, you might be coming to that one too. For your students on spring break, there's an organizing camping retreat. So figuring out how you can plug in if you want to do research on endangered plants in the Bad River water area, if you want to just learn who you can connect with and who Absolutely. you maybe should network with. Frank knows a lot of people, Andy knows a lot of people in that area so we can have a strong community to make sure this doesn't happen and it will never happen because it's Every single one of you is just as important as the next person, not to sound like your guidance counselor. So even if you don't have gas money, we want you to go. We want to find a way for you to go to the Pinocchio Hills area. If you haven't seen it, if you know someone else that maybe it would be beneficial for them to like touch the place where the ore is going to come out of March 17th and 19th, and April 6th and 7th, and Frank will know more about the April 6th and 7th date. Just before you left, I'm like, there's other things, too. If you want to take a tour of the area, a walking tour, it's still open to the public. Uh, we've taken legislators, everybody that wants to, send us an email, and uh, we'll arrange to give you a tour, and you can actually walk through and see the place yourself. Yes? I also wanted to mention that L. Gedix will be here Friday at 4 p.m. Uh, he will be speaking in the DUC, the Legacy Room on the third floor. Uh, Frank had mentioned him before. And then at 6 p.m. on Friday, we're having Dr. Jim Meeker, who did his, I think it was his dissertation or thesis, one of the two, sorry, on the Kakagan Sloughs and the wetlands in this area. Um, so he will be speaking at 6 p.m. That will be in Debo 073. Uh, after that, there is a wild rice dinner that will follow, and the cost of that is seven dollars to cover cover food expenses, and also there's about a dollar or two worked into that for a donation to save the water's edge. So. Well, I, I'll stay here all night. So if you want to go, go. <laughs> but yes. Uh, so if if they're pumping all this water out, are they going to affect groundwater levels, and will that have an impact on Absolutely. on the water quality and the and the wild rice? Absolutely. So not just the sulfide, but also the the water, the water level levels. table level. And, and the the fluctuation of the water is what really affect wild rice. But Jim Meeker knows more about and Andy know more about wild rice than I just eat it. <laughs> Yes. You had mentioned having a concern about water coming up into, into the cavity. Yes. Uh, it reminds me, I used to live in Missoula, Montana, but driving through Butte, oh, really? there was an enormous hole in the ground, and they've had, they didn't do a good study of the hydrology, so for the past,